Welcome back to the Cave of Wonders, Dreamwalkers. I am your Sith Lord Callus for Lord Callus TV. And this is another Callus recap and review. Today I want to talk to you guys about The Mandalorian Season 2, Episode 11, The Heiress. So let's get right into it. Chapter 11 is appropriately named The Heiress. Those that dive into the Star Wars novels and the animated Star Wars series will be reintroduced to a couple of fan favorites in this episode, whether it's in the flesh or simply the promise of a name. Chapter 9 started the season strong and then Chapter 10 slowed us down a little, taking Din Djarin and the child on a little side quest where they picked up another passenger. But the heiress comes out the gate swinging. Mando and the passenger, appropriately named Frog Lady, try desperately to land the damaged Razor Crest on the Water Moon Trask, where the Frog Lady will reunite with her husband. They manage to bring the ship through the atmosphere without burning to bits and almost stick a perfect landing on the docks. Almost. The Razor Crest topples to the side and into the sea where it has to be extracted by a crane that actually looks far more like an AT-AT than a traditional crane. Safely on solid ground, the Frog Lady and now the Frog Man are reunited and fortunately the child was not able to gobble up any more of their eggs. But here is where we get a glimpse of Sasha Banks' character from the trailers ever mysterious in her dark cloak, and then suddenly, she is gone. The frog couple point Din Djarin toward the tavern where he should be able to find the information he is seeking, the whereabouts of more Mandalorians. He and the child make their way to the lodge, which is full of Quarren patrons and Mon Calamari workers. After Mando kills an octopus face hugger that was alive in the child's soup, he pays the Mon Calamari worker with Mon Cala credits he earned in Season 1 for a bit of information. Soon a Quarren fisherman joins Din Djarin at his table and tells him that he can take him to find the Mandos he's seeking on his ship. They set sail but something just seems off about this fisherman and we know the Quarren to be problematic in the Star Wars lore. So it is no coincidence that the Mon Calamari was not the one to have the information Din Djarin was seeking. As the group is sailing to their destination, the Quarren offers to show Mando what a Mamacor looks like when it's feeding. With the child in his crib at his side, Din Djarin watches as the Quarren opens a hatch in the middle of the ship and dangles a net of fish over the hole to entice the monster to the surface. Now as the Mamacor breaks the surface, the Quarren knocks Baby Yoda into the water and the Mamacor swallows him whole. Din Djarin leaps in after him and the Quarren shut the gate, trapping Mando in the water. Now like so many others, the Quarren are after the Beskar armor. They poke and stab at him, hoping he'll drown and they can just peel the armor off of his dead body. But no such luck. The cavalry arrives. Three Mandos in familiar blue painted armor jetpack in to save the day. They make easy work of the fishermen and then save the child from the bed Betty or the belly? Come on, Callus, the belly of the Mamacor. Mando is visibly shaken up from nearly drowning in the thought of losing the child without fulfilling his quest. But when the other three Mandos remove their helmets to face him, he is even more shocked and accuses them of stealing their armor from real Mandalorians. This scene gave me goosebumps as I listened to Katie Sackhoff announce herself as Bo-Katan, the rightful ruler of Mandalore. Katie actually voiced that character in The Clone Wars where we first meet her, and again in The Rebels where she is given the Darksaber and pronounced the ruler of Mandalore. With her is Casca Reeves, played by Sasha Banks, and Axe Wolves, played by Simon Cassianides. Bo-Katan explains to Din Djarin that her armor has been in her family for generations. She tells him that she was born on Mandalore and is the last of Clan Kreese, one of many that fought during the Purge. 
It is his devotion to the belief that a Mandalorian should not remove their helmet in the presence of another human that lets Bo know that he must belong to the sect of Mandalorian zealots known as the Child of the Watch, who follow the old ways. Now I have to admit that this scene raised a few questions for me. First, was Bo-Katan stating that Din Djarin was a Child of the Watch, meaning that he grew up raised by the Death Watch? Or is it that the Child of the Watch is the name of the sect? Also, was this always Favreau's intention? Or did he simply correct a mistake that he made by introducing this fact that the Mandos don't remove their helmets into the lore? Honestly, I'm okay with it either way because we now have another path opening up for the Mando to follow, which could bring about some very interesting lore aspects. But as the conversation continues, we see that Bo-Katan is essentially leading another rebellion since we've last seen her in The Rebels and Season 7 of The Clone Wars. She is hell-bent on retrieving the weapon that was stolen from her, the Darksaber. She is the heiress and must be the one to defeat Moff Gideon to take back what is rightfully hers. Mando doesn't want to hear it and he jets back to the docks where he encounters the Quarren's brother that was just killed. Outnumbered, Mando is saved once again by Bo-Katan's trio who never turn their back on a fellow Mando. She tells Din Djarin of her plan to hijack the weapons being carried on an Imperial ship and offers to help him with his quest by offering the whereabouts of a Jedi that he seeks. This time Mando agrees and leaves the child with the frog couple so they can do their business uninterrupted. Now the Mandos are a group of four and they jetpack up to the Imperial ship and begin their assault, effectively destroying every trooper they come across. This scene was both action-filled and comical, but not in a slapstick sort of way. The Mandos eventually capture the cargo room filled with weapons they were seeking, and Din Djarin believes he has fulfilled his end of the bargain. But this is where we see some Darth Vader in Bo-Katan, as she explains that she is now altering the deal, as Vader said to Lando Calrissian on Cloud City. She reveals that not only is she looking for the weapons, but she wants to hijack the ship itself. Meanwhile, in the cockpit, we get our first hollow image of Moff Gideon for this season, and we have a clear indication of how truly ruthless he must be if season one didn't already answer that question for you. Realizing there was not going to be any backup coming to save them, the Imperial captain understands what must be done. Destroy the ship with everything and everyone aboard, rather than let it fall back into the hands of the Mandalorians, lest he face the wrath of Moff Gideon. Hail Hydra. I mean, I mean, long live the Empire. The captain kills his pilots and begins to steer the ship back down into the sea, but the Mandalorians will not give up that easily. Faced with a squad of stormtroopers with repeaters, Din Djarin puts all of his faith in his Beskar armor as he charges forward with two detonators that he's able to lob into the crowd of troopers blocking their way into the cockpit. Once inside, they manage to save the ship in time and spare the captain's life in exchange for the location of Gideon and the Darksaber. But rather than suffer at the hands of Gideon, the captain takes his own life, leaving Bo-Katan seething at her loss. Now that their mission is accomplished, she asks Din Djarin if he'll join them on yet another mission to save Mandalore. He tells her that the world is cursed and reminds her that he has his own mission, quested to him by the Armorer from Season 1. Bo keeps her promise and tells him to go to the city of Kaladan on the forest planet of Corvus. There he will find none other than Ahsoka Tano. Mando is thankful and heads back to get the child from the frog couple. He sees that one egg has hatched and that baby Yoda is now fond of the hatchling. Mando scoops him up but not without protest and they head back to the Razor Crest where the dock worker has done less than a, a shoddy job of making the repairs. 
and as they leave the atmosphere, another creepy creature that was stowed away, resembling a baby Mamacore, tries to attack Baby Yoda. But Mando catches it just in time and feeds it to the youngling. And that is where this episode ends. This was a great episode. It brought us back on track with the main plot and introduces a ton of new story elements that can be explored in future episodes and possibly into future seasons or maybe even spin-offs. We got Bo-Katan, Ahsoka Tano, if only in name, the child of the watch. There's a lot to digest in this episode and I have to admit that I'm excited to see what the subsequent episodes will bring. But you guys let me know your thoughts in the comments. Did you enjoy the heiress? Are you excited to see that this seems to be turning out to be a live action extension of the Clone Wars and maybe even the Rebels? Make sure to subscribe for more Star Wars content and if you'd like to support the channel even more, we have memberships available by clicking that join button. I really appreciate it. Listen, I do what I love. I hope you love what I do. This has been a callous review. Until next time.